Hello everyone and welcome back to the Film Score Podcast. This is going to be, unfortunately, the last episode of 2022. Although, given that it's Christmas Eve, that shouldn't really come as a surprise. And I'll actually be taking a slight break, so you won't hear from me again until around the end of January. Figured I'd enjoy the holidays a little bit and have a smidgen of time off. Today, my guest is Nathan Johnson. Nathan and I talk about the brand new film Glass Onion, for which he scored the second entry in the Benoit Blanc Knives Out film series. Ton of fun. I saw it in theaters a few weeks back, and it got a great reaction, so if you do watch it, recommend trying to get a handful of people over. It's a real crowd pleaser. And Nathan's score is a lot of fun, too. It, it really builds on the original, taking some of the themes that they developed there, building them out, adding new ones, adding new instruments, really making it a bit bigger, more lush, and then there's this kind of curious, uh, devilish harpsichord that makes its way throughout, acting as kind of a, a signature sound, signature instrument. Funnily enough, I, I actually, when I first heard the first theme, very first cue, thought, oh, they're harking back to the original, to the first film. And then I re-listened to Knives Out and realized, nope, I don't think there's any harpsichord in there. So we talk about Glass Onion, we talk about, and there's no spoilers in there, so even if you haven't seen it, nothing's going to get ruined for you. We talk a bit more broadly about his career, about working with Ryan Johnson, and we find time to get into his work with Guillermo del Toro on Nightmare Alley, another fantastic film and a really good score from Nathan as well. The thing that annoys me about guys like Nathan is they only do, like, one score a year, a score every other year. Justin Hurwitz takes this to the extreme, and you just want to hear more from them. Maybe we'll get lucky, but Nathan seems pretty picky in what he chooses and content, so maybe we won't. Of course, you can find more about Nathan on his social media, on his website. You do the same for me. And I hope you're not too sad by my absence to start the year, but this one should hold you over for a little while. Now sit back and I hope you enjoy. Nathan, thanks so much for joining me. How have you been? Good, good. How are you, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I have to, When I record, I turn my heat off and it's like 25 degrees in Chicago right now, so I'm a little chilly. Wow. No, <laughs> I don't envy you. I don't envy you. The suffering that, that I have to endure for this podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Glass Onion just came out. It actually just finished, as of recording, just finished its brief theatrical run like two or three days ago. I'm sure that you wrapped up your score a while before that. So, have you had a chance to relax a little bit? I know that you do all sorts of projects, not just in the scoring world. So, you instead had uh, various other things to fill your time. Yeah, there there have been a handful of other things, but uh, but it's yeah, it's been really fun. Just kind of finally at this point when the movie comes out, getting to premiere it and getting to sneak into theaters while it's playing and just see see people's response. It's uh, it's yeah, super fun and really rewarding. With that in particular, were there any responses either to the film or there's there's some sequences in the film where the music I found was like really prominent. So were any responses that surprised you or you felt a little gratifying? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always just super gratifying when anytime you get to put something out and feel like, oh yes, this is this is doing what we hoped it was going to do. And it's, it's having the, the same response that I had when I first read the script. I always say it feels like Christmas morning anytime Ryan sends me the new script, you know, <laughs> because it's like we've been kind of talking about it. And then, and then one day in my inbox, it'll, it'll drop with a, for your eyes only subject line. And, uh, and at that moment I, I get to sort of just clear the afternoon and I'm not thinking about music. I'm not thinking about anything other than just getting to read it as a fan of one of my favorite writers in the world. So, um, yeah, when when it when it then a year or two later drops in the cinemas, it's it's really fun to kind of see audience reacting the way that I reacted when I first read it. Oh, that's that's awesome. I'd I'd kill to be in that position, but uh, I I doubt Ryan will be sending me scripts anytime soon. 
<laughs> so now, obviously, like you mentioned, th- that first read through is really you as a fan diving in, being engaged by the story, and that's it. Yeah. But after that first read, are you then getting into the initial thoughts of what the music might be? Yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, and those those usually start with conversations with Ryan or if I, you know, if I start going down a road and then we talk with Ryan, I'm like, oh, OK, we're going to do this a different way. That's so one of the things I love about Ryan is he's really good at sort of creating a unique sandbox to play in each time out. And we have done so many different genres and different explorations and and it's always really really fun to uh, to hear what he's imagining for for the film and then that's sort of the starting gun and then I get to just immerse myself in that world and dive into it so yeah but those conversations start really early on sometimes even before before script stage but then they kind of develop and grow as as we get into it and so for take glass onion in particular what do those initial conversations sound like what are the ideas that he's mentioning or you know what concepts are you two talking about at those very early stages well so okay so for glass onion uh, I think early on he was really focused on the idea that this is going to be fun. Um, we want to lean into this this adventure. Ryan talks about when he is making these movies. Obviously, it's a murder mystery, so it can feel puzzly in a way. But his goal is not to create a crossword puzzle. His goal mm. is to create a roller coaster ride. It's no fun sitting in a movie for two hours just trying to solve a puzzle, and then at the end of the time you figure it out, and then great. That's how a crossword puzzle works. That's not how a movie works. And so for Glass Onion, he was he was talking, you know, obviously we we made this right after lockdown, so we're feeling the same things these characters are feeling. Everyone has a little bit of cabin fever and this cast of characters gets a, an invitation to a private island and so after months of of being homebound they're given an invitation to jet off to to Greece and so Ryan was saying we really want to kind of lean into that you know we were talking about film scores that we love for like sort of 70s stuff Nino Rota um mm. you know Bernard Herrmann like all of all of these things are touch points to us but at the same time it is a murder mystery and we kind of started that in a pretty particular way with Knives Out and specifically in terms of the quartet in Knives Out it's very jagged it's very precise and cutting and for that film you know we were talking about let's hear every instrument we want to be able to hear all the counter melodies all the different lines and we don't want it to feel like just sort of a big wash of sound. So even though with Glass Onion we're we're using a, a much bigger orchestra, we're kind of blowing it open at the same time, really leaning into that precision, so that it's you know it's all interlocking and very custom custom scored to the scenes. Hmm. And I think too having the bulk of the score focusing on like the fun, the adventure, the roller coaster, it, it makes something like the theme you have for Andy's character stand out even more. You know, the the first time you see her is maybe 15 minutes into the film and she's very clearly this outcast character. And the theme yep. that accompanies her is a little darker, a little more somber. And, you know, it has that you know, much more minimal piano theme that really sets her apart. Yeah, and with, you know, with Andy's theme, here's another thing, you know, obviously getting to do a murder mystery with Ryan is an amazing experience as a composer because we're getting to really explore the height and depth and the breadth of of what what you can do in a film score. There's the lush romanticism, there's like the lyrical opulence, and then there's the tension. But something that's really, really important is you have to care about these characters. Mm. And Andy's theme was sort of my emotional doorway into the movie. You know, Janelle gives such an amazing performance. And it's so multi-layered. And, and so with her theme, it was really important that we care about her character, right? And, and that, that is a key thing. But also with her theme, you, you know, you talked about the minimal piano. It was, it was important to have 
a theme that could be powerful and vulnerable at the same time or you know mysterious mm -hmm. and romantic at the same time you know it's something that we could also reinterpret throughout the movie as it goes along so you bring up Andy's theme but that was really aside from the fun or the tension that was really the emotional core that was the doorway for me into the movie but it's it's an interesting point where you bring up wanting to be able to use that theme in various ways and i, I think that's something that you know i've found as a through line with some of your recent scores and not just the two knives out films but also with nightmare alley where again that's a film that you know has a really strong recurring main theme that mm -hmm. you utilize in a number of ways is that something that you feel more comfortable with or push for or is it really just like a, a style that seems to fit naturally with those films i yeah, that's a great question i mean i think it's something i grew up loving from john williams to to the italian composers even wagner you know it's like they're writing leitmotifs and those trace the characters through the story. When Ryan and I did our first movie, Brick, together, I I didn't know what I was doing. This was the first time that I had done a score, and we we kind of talked about approaching Brick in sort of the most extreme version of that, in, in almost the Peter and the Wolf way, where it's not just a melodic theme, but it's actually a, a literal instrument that represents each character in mm. that movie. But yeah, it's it's something, I think that style of scoring has almost fallen out of vogue in, in the last couple decades, you know, it's, and has, has been replaced to a certain extent by by sort of drone-based scores or, or atmospheric-based scores, which those can work amazingly as well. But personally, I just love melodic, thematic storytelling from a musical perspective and i um i really find that that opens all of these doors when you know it's it's almost like you're you're kind of training the audience that that this character has this theme and then by the end of the movie you bring that back and it's like oh there's the chorus there's the hook i think it's one of the tools in our tool belt that we can use to hopefully connect with with that sort of ineffable thing that connection we have to music that's just really hard to to put your finger on but we know it when we feel it that's that's what we're chasing yeah and i i think both a lot of film composers and a lot of people who end up being quite big film music fans like that's the type of scoring that they grew up with whether it be things like herman or goldsmith horner john williams danny elfman like all those people doing really theme melody driven things so i do empathize with a lot of people for having a, a frustration or a longing for those to come back in vogue a little bit more but it is reassuring it's nice seeing at least the projects that you're working on or at least the these two knives out films where you're getting involved early having the opportunity to do something like that i, I know with Nightmare Alley, I, um, you came in late as a, a replacement for Displa, but even that, I don't know how much time you had, but still had the opportunity to do something melodic. So is that something, or is that opportunity something that is something you look for when you're choosing a project to take on, or does it just happen to come up? Yeah, that's. A, I mean, that's a great question, and, and weirdly, I think the answer is no. I'm when I'm taking projects, I'm never thinking about the music. I'm I'm such a such a film fan and such a narrative fan the only thing i'm thinking about at that point is is the story good and and is the director someone i want to work with you know and we all make decisions about the projects we work on in different ways but for me that is really the pinnacle and the first thing that i'm thinking about the way that i am a fan of this art form i would rather be working on a on a movie that i was over the moon about and doing the most minimal score than working on something that i that i didn't really connect with from a storytelling perspective and writing you know my magnum opus like i i guess i wouldn't say utilitarian but there is an aspect of that i i view film music as I mean, it's not its own thing, you know, and we, we, we get to release a score after the fact and, and hopefully people enjoy that and en enjoy listening to it. And we, we all have scores that, that mean so much outside of the film, but really the, the goal of film music is storytelling. So I want to be helping to tell the best stories that exist. Relatedly, do you think that connecting with the story or 
being a personal fan of the story that you're working on also, whether subconsciously or not, helps to write something better as well? Potentially. I mean, hopefully. I don't it, It's that's, that's a great question, but too hard for me as a composer <laughs> to, to answer. Uh, what sure. I do know is that it gives you the engine, the drive, right? So when, when Guillermo sent me Nightmare Alley, he sent it to me with no music, just plain raw wherever they were with it at that point in the edit, which was pretty close to the final edit. And I sat down and watched it that night and it just walloped me. And I was like, I love this movie and I think I understand this character. And so I, I think the next morning I met with him and just barely talked to him about music. I talked to him about the character. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was so interesting, the story that he was telling and the way that that character, almost unlike most characters in in modern western narrative that character sort of doesn't go on an arc right and, and the way the stories work is usually a character starts here and then they go through this crazy thing and then they end up and they're in a different place and with nightmare alley i was i was just stunned because this character just kept hitting the same note through it and and i and that that was to me that was the unlocking of like i think i know how to score this because i feel like i understand who this character is Likewise with Glass Onion, it's about as far from that as you can yeah. get. But but again, it's it's like connecting with the stories. And to me, that just feels like the best playground. You don't come into it with a blank page. In a sense, you come into it with these really deep characters and this this structural thing that has been really precisely put together to accomplish hopefully a response in the audience and and so that to me feels like the opposite of sitting down to a blank page and freaking out it's more of like i was saying when you connect with the story it's the engine that is is generating these ideas and and of course when you're working on a creative project especially collaborating with a director there are going to be moments where your first second or third idea isn't what they were imagining and when you have an engine that is obsessed with the story and loves the story that they're telling, that is the thing that kind of drives you to get there and to find what it is, what what is that connection point that we can agree on and, and sort of then use to help the movie in, in the best way that it can. Hmm. There were a few different things that I, I wanted to touch on, but I can't do them all at once. So first, on that last point, were there any ideas or concepts that you had or, or even you know initial sketches or cues that didn't quite work out once you know they were put against the picture when when ryan heard them yeah it uh, this was actually sort of before picture stage but um so with ryan's movies that i have the rare sort of luxury of coming on board really early so we're talking about the idea for the story before he's even fully written it and then i get to go on set so I'm, I'm kind of watching the, the performances as, as they're developing, and I, I have a mobile rig with me, so I'm writing ideas. And it took me a, a while to find the main theme. So the, there, were, there were false starts on that where Ryan was like, oh, it's not really that, it's this. But this is all happening really early on, and that's, that's what this luxury enables, is it, it lets you kind of explore and go down these rabbit holes that don't have to be the final thing. But uh, once we got back... And they started editing. I that was kind of the moment where I finally felt like I cracked the main theme, and I showed it to Ryan, and he lit up, and it was like, okay, that's that's the point, you know, that that's the that's like the title theme, our theme from Glass Onion. And when I when I cracked that, yeah, that was like, okay, I got, I, I know what this is about, and I know what this needs to feel like. Was there anything that you can pin down that distinguished the final main theme, the theme that makes it into the film, compared to the other ideas you had that didn't quite make it? It was better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, no, I think, I think there was, um, there was sort of a, a lush romanticism about it that maybe the earlier tries didn't have. And it, it felt fun, but grand. And obviously we, you know, we talked about Nino Rota's theme for death on the Nile and you can, you can hear influences of that, the sort of the brass fanfare, but I was listening to a lot of French pop from the 60s and 70s and mm. the, these like sort of slippery string arrangements um, that, that sneak in there. That was a big touch point for me is I, I wanted to, to have these like heavy vibratos, 
which personally is something that I had never really like lent towards before. I um I really I love imperfection in in music, and I I I love when I'm working with strings to have to have them be dry and just kind of scraping across the strings, no vibrato. But with this, it was like turn up the vibrato, like dial it all the way up, and and you know all these these portamentos, these slides, you know, that was that was just so much fun to to tap deep into these very melodic lyrical scores that, that we loved growing up. And is that general palette something that was always on your mind and Ryan's mind? And I, I ask that in part because when you go to the first Knives Out film it's it's this like rich old money family where something orchestral feels really natural and and here you have like a modern tech billionaire and so like you could have something that's more you know modern electronic as well and i was very curious with that background what the sound was actually going to be like yeah um well one of the things that ryan often does when we start a project is he'll he'll kind of zig when when you would expect him to zag so um it's definitely like still in the world but you know, for Brick, that's like a film noir set in a high school. And I th- uh, thankfully, because we had almost no budget there, thankfully in Ryan's, Ryan, uh, in Ryan's mind, this high school was like everyone listened to Tom Waits instead of Britney Spears at that point. You know what I mean? So so it, it, it sort of worked with this like broken down, slightly out of tune thing. And uh, that's not the kind of music most people are listening to in high school. But I think it it like works in this weird way. Yeah. And so even though for the first knives out, even though we start it with this jagged string quartet, and that's I think that's the piece that most people remember, that is a full orchestral score. And when I was initially getting ready for that, I was kind of I was thinking like, what if we do this small ensemble and it's it's just like really small strings throughout. And Ryan Ryan was saying like, oh, I feel like it's already a, a small contained manor house let's Mm. let's do a big orchestral score for that and blow it open a little bit for glass onion it's it's bigger but but also it's like well now we bring in harpsichord which doesn't feel like that fits grease at one level you know but again it it brings almost the harpsichord would have made more sense in the first one yeah if you're if you're just kind of going from a gut reaction but i i think both of us always like that contrast where you're not underlining everything that's already happening on screen. You're kind of hopefully playing against it and, and, and through doing that, hopefully mining a little bit of ambiguity and something, something that's odd that doesn't feel quite right. It's interesting because I hadn't heard Knives Out in, I don't know, a couple of years before I watched Glass Onion. So right at the beginning, I, I have almost illegibly scribbled in my little notepad like oh wow the, like the harpsichord really ties into the first film thinking like yeah of course that's what they used but yeah uh, you know it didn't happen not there no not there <laughs> bricks an interesting analogy because like that's a film where it obviously can't really exist in real life no high school has those interests no whole group of students talks and acts like they do but everything is gone at it a hundred percent yeah it's sincerely and genuinely done that as the audience once you're in it for five minutes you buy in and i think that's how having a musical choice that isn't necessarily like the full-on gut reaction obvious choice does yeah yeah totally and you know i think that with brick ryan always described that as not how high school was but how high school felt Mm. um Often when adults make movies about kids, nothing feels, the stakes don't feel heightened or, or important. But when you're in high school, it feels like life and death, the, which so, social circles you're running in, what, whether someone sits with you for lunch or, you know, a breakup feels like the end of the world. It, it um, you know, our whole approach on that was not to treat it as a parody. It was just to really dive in. And I, I think that that, really i think carries through to all of ryan's movies like we're playing in in sandboxes that that exist we're we're using genres that we love but it is we're bringing honor hopefully an honor and a seriousness and to it and not just a a a parody yeah when and i think the the benoit blanc character in particular and actually a lot of the characters in both films could in different hands 
or if handled differently, could feel like silly caricatures. And and maybe in, you know, small amounts or, or contexts they, they do in the film as well, intentionally. But you take Blanc, you take um, Duke, Dave Batista's character, like, in one sense, those are caricatures, but they're also handled sincerely that and, and given a depth and a breadth that, like, you believe totally. them 100%. Totally. Well, and I, you know, I remember when the first Knives Out came out, some people were like, oh, that that ridiculous accent that Daniel Craig is doing. But a good friend of mine, Kelly, she was like, no, that's exactly how my grandfather sounded. She's <laughs> she's from I forget exactly where she's from, but she was like, no, 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 that's like literally and that's 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 exactly what my grandfather sounded like. And Daniel was saying, you know, with I mean, he like trained for months with a dialect coach to do that. And, and he did it again for this movie because he didn't want to just, you know, he had kind of forgotten it and he didn't want to just mm. do a caricature. He and he brings such, I mean, he is like such a hard worker and he, he makes it look easy, but it is he's so committed and brings that that highest level of commitment to the role to this. And it's great to know that that's happening under the surface because it's such a fun experience as as an audience watching that. Well, I, I was going to say it's it's got to be a testament to the music to an extent where you imagine he and everyone else have worked hard, but it never comes across that way. It's really the, the fun, the adventure that is. One thing that I did want to ask about, and I haven't seen the show or listened to the score fully, but I, I know that in uh, Rings of Power, there were a lot of people who began theorizing what character would end up being Sauron based on hints in Bear McCreary's score. I was curious if there was ever a, a desire and impetus to do things like that in this or Knives Out to give musical hints or misdirections as to what might be happening. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I would never want to give the movie away in the score Mm -hmm. but also i kind of think like no one's really gonna follow that especially (laughs) on first listen you know yeah um but but there definitely are things and this is something that i've played around with at different times but i'm really into this concept of theme stealing and so that does happen there's a character that steals another character's theme in glass onion from a very specific storytelling perspective and again i don't I'm not under the uh, the misconception that someone's going to pick that up on the first or even second or third watch. But I do think when you're writing a, a leitmotif heavy score, that means you can you can have another character steal someone's theme. And then obviously I have a reason that I'm doing that, but it's not just a head reason. It's also like accomplishing something emotionally. and And it's something where you don't ever have to follow that because it works emotionally in the scene as well but maybe if you do there are there are mm-hmm. some fun little easter eggs to follow on that level and that's that's something that Ryan was really i think excited about in the whole storytelling perspective is just playing really fair with the audience so if you if you go back and watch this again there's lots of stuff in plain sight that you can see and there's there are those fun things because obviously as a as a filmmaker you can you can kind of show somebody anything anything you want and then it's like hi it wasn't that we didn't show you but it's 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 like a fun element too yeah um with all of our tools make sure we're playing fair and we're we're like doing things for a purpose saying that people on a first or second listen might not notice those types of things but it still works in an emotional aspect do you think that to an extent it it works subconsciously as well i i do i mean and and this is like getting into you know the nebulous realm but hey we get to do that because yeah. music already sort of op- operates on that realm <laughs> but um yeah i um maybe this is just a story that you tell ourselves but even if so it's it's helpful i, I think there's um there's a resonance and 100 percent there there is at some emotional level a remembrance right so if you you hear a theme enough times connected to a character and then you hear that with a different character at some level i think it might feel a little bit odd and it's just at this sub subconscious yeah who knows i don't know (laughs) (laughs) but i mean that's the beauty of of music especially yeah yeah i did want to ask 
I would imagine that when the first film came out, it was just a standalone movie. Eventually, Netflix picks it up for two more films. At that point, was there anything that, knowing there would be multiple entries, you would have done differently in the first film? Or that you did differently in Glass Onion, knowing that there would at least be one more entry to follow? Yeah, I mean, I think I think at that moment, then then it's like, okay, so we've got a Blanc theme and maybe a couple Blanc themes and just sort of like crystallizing mm. what those are. You know, I was I was talking with a friend the other day and he was telling me examples of, of films where there are a series, but one of the main characters didn't have a theme till the second or third one. And, and a theme that was one thing then suddenly became the main person's theme because it just fits so well. So yeah, there's there's like that element when you're working with motifs and, and character motifs that sort of gets honed in and crystallized as as it goes on. But really, I mean, I don't I don't know if I'm smart enough to have like the master plan for that for ten movies, you know, or yeah. whatever it is. Like I it's enough of a challenge to to <laughs> score a single movie. But then that that's that's also the the nice thing about kind of creating things and then building on it is you don't have every possibility in the world. You you get to look back and say, oh, this is what we've got to work with. And now we build on that moving forward. And really with these anyway, because like we said, they're less like sequels and yeah. and more like new chapters. Hopefully they all feel like they fit their own movie like a glove while while still honoring the tradition of the world we're creating. Yeah, you know, that it's a good point because it isn't simply a continuing story like you'll have with marvel movies for instance or you take some of like the star wars films the main um trilogy of trilogies right. here it's it's its own entries that really do stand alone and that have to be distinct but that also fit in the broader context of the other films too to change gears a little bit i don't know if when you and ryan were first working on Glass Onion, whether you knew that there would be a limited theatrical release up front. But do you approach mixing a score differently if you know it's going to be in theaters versus something streaming where it's going to be a, a primarily at-home listening experience where people are going to have all sorts of different setups? Maybe they're listening or watching on uh, on a laptop instead of a TV. Yeah, no, I um, I mean, I've never thought about that with movies. Um, I, I, you know, I've done a little bit of stuff specifically for TV, and I guess I'm, I, I, I'm thinking about that maybe a little bit. I'm aware that that people aren't going to have that most people aren't going to have full on surround systems, but but even then, I don't know that that changes too much the the practical approach of of how I'm scoring something. Uh, it definitely does at a mixed level. I, I feel like from a creative level, that's, that's not something that I'm, that I'm thinking a whole lot about in terms of how do we tell the story in the best way possible. I gotcha. That makes sense. And again, on, a, on another different note, and you touched on a little bit with Brick, where that was the first feature that you scored. You'd done that after spending several years doing some uh, some work in a band. When you first started on that and when you were in the scoring world for a little bit, coming from like a rock slash band background, was there a period where you felt like an outsider having an, an element of imposter syndrome because oh, you didn't come through? Like, I still the normal... feel like that. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think everyone feels like that. That's like the insidious thing about imposter syndrome, right? Though, is you can't you can't realize that everybody feels that way. It's like, oh, I I'm the only one who feels this way. But here's the great thing that's that's like a, an antidote to that is the things that you feel like might be your Achilles heels are are also the things that make your voice unique and and give it a certain imprint. That's like for anyone maybe who's who's watching, who's who's getting started or, or wanting to do more work in this area, hopefully that's helpful to hear because it you know, it whatever whatever it is that, that makes you feel like you don't know what you're doing, if you just humbly kind of lean into into keeping on going and, and learning what you can and, and working with people to to supplement those things, I think in the end that 
there's a whole world available for lots of different creativity and lots of different voices. And that's, that's what makes it interesting. You know, I, I always say like my favorite artists from a musical performance perspective don't have perfect voices. I love, I love those imperfections in, in music and in voices. Those are the things that I feel um, makes music interesting, makes art interesting. It's, um, yeah, uh, I, I remember reading this interview with Paul Thomas Anderson and uh, mm. someone was sitting down in the edit with him and saying, like, yeah, this this like section just kind of doesn't make sense. And he turned around with a smile on his face and said, yeah, isn't it great? <laughs> um, and I love that, you know, it's like that's, I don't know, but that's sort of an extrapolation of your answer that immediately turns it positive. But it is a very real feeling to feel like, oh man, I don't know what I'm doing. I think, I think in brick, I, I remember like freaking out because it was like, I've never done this before. I only have a vague perception of how, how this is done professionally, but it was, it was like leaning into, you know, leaning into the elements that we had for that. And I think that that gave it a, a really sort of its own, its own stamp. Hmm. It's interesting. And it's, I think it also holds true for, for my listening taste, and I think for a lot of people's, there is something that not just endearing, but that adds like a distinction when you hear imperfections, whether it be in in playing, in recording, mixing, or in someone's voice that lets it stand apart and stand on its own. You can, I think, more easily in one sense replicate something that's maybe more closely to perfectly like played than mm -hmm. trying to replicate intentionally imperfections. I think I could uh, hold you here for a while asking more about Glass Onion. Uh, I know there were a lot of things I actually wanted to know about Nightmare Alley, too. Ask, ask it. <laughs> All right. All right, I, I will. So with Nightmare Alley in particular, I think that was the first time you'd gone in to replace someone else. You mentioned that when you first watched it, when you first got the cut from Guillermo, there was no music at all. But did the fact that you were coming in after someone else change those conversations that you had with Guillermo? Did it? Do you think that it, it changed his approach to music in the film? Um, I think I think that it. Thankfully for that one, I just got to come in dry, mm. um, and and that and that was what I wanted. I didn't want to hear anything else and. It was a really cool experiment in connecting with something on a gut level. That's actually the first movie I've ever composed that didn't have any temp music in it. Mm. Um, so it was just very purely reacting to the powerful story and the and the incredible performances that that he had captured, which felt like, oh, I don't know if I can do that, and I and I loved it. The amazing thing with Ryan, you know, you, the, you talk about temp music and and most composers hate it because directors will will get temp love and then it's yeah. like well i'm never going to be able to replace that the, the amazing thing with ryan is that he just doesn't get temp love so my experience with temp music when working with ryan is is actually like really helpful because it's like okay well the, whatever the temp's kind of doing this but here's what i like about it at this point i, I like the tempo or i like how it's doing this it, it's sort of just like a very practical thing that we can talk about and then i can throw away and and just like not listen to anymore so I feel like that that's a really helpful thing when you're working with a director who's who's not going to get super entrenched in it and eventually ask you to start getting as close as you can to it yeah. without legally ripping it off. You know, that's not something that I've had to deal with with Ryan, but on Nightmare Alley it was it was actually kind of amazing to just sit down and feel like I'm getting to sit in this luxurious estate and purely respond with what my instincts are with the characters, you know, and, and, and again with that, we, you know, we had conversations early on, like, we're not trying to make this a noir thing. We're not trying to ape these old things. Like it, it was just, yeah, it felt like a really kind of amazing, pure gift to just respond to what I already felt was an amazingly powerful movie and to really let myself be driven by the story and and to collaborate with Guillermo, he would sit right here, right in this chair that you can't see, 
and we'd play stuff together and he would he was always very specific what if what if we add yeah, i like that but what if it's on like a low cello and i was like all right let's let's try that you know and it was it just felt like really really wonderful it was i loved it so that's that's such an interesting anecdote at the very end because i've i've heard from other composers where some of the most difficult directors to work with are ones that have a a musical knowledge and also get very much into the specifics but it sounds like this was the opposite and was part of the reason why it was a nice experience like was he also open-minded into oh yeah we tried on a low cello but it didn't work so totally onto something else yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and he's he's such an amazing collaborator he's he's very hands-on but he's it's not like he gets uh, again it's i think great collaborators are in, in my experience this is a great collaborator somebody who has a very very clear vision of what the thing is that they're making and and therefore creates a, a specific sandbox for you to work in but then at that moment they release you to surprise them so mm. we're, we're not playing in some other sandbox i'm i'm playing in the sandbox of their world but they're they're not micromanaging that they want me to bring whatever with it you know we can filter it through whatever my likes and interests and inspirations are and and sort of bring my voice to the world inside of the sandbox that they've set up i i think that's such a cool and actually inspiring way to phrase it that there is a a constraint put on you at the same time you're able to run free within that and i i love the idea of you coming out the other side with something that's going to be unexpected or surprise the director you're working with. I think that's awesome. Yeah, well, and the thing that, that is really fun from my perspective as a composer about that is when you have a strong leader at the front, that really releases you to mm. push as far as you can because they're protecting it. I have no qualms that Ryan or Guillermo will will say to me like, "Oh, that's not working." If if they don't think it's working, and and then it's like, "Awesome, okay, let's let's like figure out what it is." So, having someone at the helm that knows where the ship is going is the most most wonderful thing because it it allows you to to kind of stretch as far as you can. Huh. I love that, and hopefully, especially younger, newer composers that might be listening in have some inspiration on that too to realize if there's someone strong up front they can see how far things can go and hopefully be reined in when it's necessary or when it's appropriate on that note and and one of the reasons i wanted to wrap up 10 minutes ago is you you set it up on such a nice uplifting upward note i was like oh gotta leave it on this and here you go 10 minutes later exact same thing so you've you've segued it perfectly once again there's more things I could ask. Yeah, we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, for uh, for the next Knives Out, maybe. But listen, I, I really appreciate you jumping on to chat. I had a ton of fun watching the film in theaters. Excellent. People were applauding, cheering, talking to the screen. Normally, I go to the theaters on like 11 a.m. on a Sunday, and so it's always empty. So it's, yeah. it's nice for once uh, having a couple people to watch it with. This is one of those movies that you want to see in a packed house. Oh, yeah. So invite all your friends when it comes out on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and on that note, Nathan, thanks again. Yeah, so nice to talk to you. Thank you.